We now have Dr. Gautam Alabhadia, who is um, currently talking about his pet to topic, uh, IVF light in developing economics, economies. Do we actually uh, need an introduction for Dr. Gautam Alabhadia? I don't think so. We know him very well, and I have personally been coming. This is the 13th year uh, that I have come for his conferences, and I believe that he does a great job of it. And every time that we come for a conference every year, we learn something new, and that is why the number of people who attend these conferences are always on the rise. Dr. Gautam Alabadia, the IVF in developing economies. Thank you. To chairpersons, seniors, colleagues, friends, the topic is IVF in developing countries. We're not only talking of IVF light that we have started in this part of the world. This presentation was, uh, I'm actually filling in for a close friend of mine, Daniel Zeidman, who is the chairman of the scientific committee. He couldn't make it due to some personal problems. I'm filling in for his lecture. This is a lecture we presented about two weeks back at the World Congress of IVF at Tunis. And uh, uh, we will discuss about what is going on in IVF and how we're making IVF more accessible to low resource countries. So what are the problems of low resource economies or low resource countries as far as ART is concerned? Treatment of infertility by effective methods remains largely the preserve of developed countries as of 2013. Most infections causing tubal damage are preventable and ART can treat the infertility. But despite being available for nearly three decades, ART is either unavailable or inaccessible to most residents of resource poor countries. And it's a fact that there's an increased need for low cost procedures in treating infertility, particularly in developing countries. One of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals was for universal access to reproductive health care by 2015. And the World Health Organization has recommended that infertility be considered a global health problem and stated the need for adaptation of ART in low resource countries. Let's begin from Africa. These are some recent papers, published papers from Africa. Muraj et al. conducted a survey in, a, in Kenya to gauge the extent of subfertility and the current state of ART provision and explore the factors limiting access to ART services. So what were the conclusions? This is an absolute 2012 publication, ART service provision in terms when we talk of ART, IVF and ICSI was severely limited only to three units in the whole country despite the reported high rate of tubal disease in Africa. The high cost of treatment, patients, limited finances, and limited local services were almost universally cited as the main barriers to providing these services in Kenya. Three ethical concerns are often mentioned specifically in regard to developing countries that why developing countries don't need ART services. One is the overpopulation argument. Second is the limited resources, both by the people and from the government. And third, the ethical problem of poorly trained practitioners offering their services to unsuspecting and uninformed infertile individuals or couples. Well, ethical problems do in fact exist, but are not unique to developing countries and the difficulties relating to ART are likely to be greater in developing countries than in developed ones because of the limited resources and the larger number of poor people residing there. An African study group has developed a simple intrauterine insemination technique in cutting down costs for dissemination of these services. This is a unique paper I picked up in the research for this lecture where without the need for sophisticated equipment, costly material, or even culture media, they don't use culture media for IUI. They just spin the sperms. And without culture media, the pellet that they get is used for IUI. 
and it is quite inexpensive, is performed by trained staff such as nurses or midwives, and in this study, 20 to 27 percent of couples remained clinically pregnant after an average of 3.5 to 3.8 IUI procedures. This is from 2012, December. IVF is the definitive line of therapy for many couples. Stimulation cycles are associated with risks of ovarian hyperstimulation, multiple pregnancy. This study from Egypt evaluated the client acceptability of stimulated versus natural cycle IVF with respect to cost and pregnancy outcome. The majority of patients who completed their IVF treatment, 90% did, felt the price of the medical service offered was high and 68% accepted the idea of having cheaper drugs with fewer side effects but with possibly lower chances of pregnancy. Does natural cycle IVF have a chance of becoming mainstream in these low resource countries? Well, natural cycle IVF has emerged as a potential option that might be suitable for patients worldwide, especially in developing countries. This quest for making IVF more widespread in low resource economies has been on for quite a few years. And a Thai group presented in 2007, I believe, their simplified IVF program at Ramati Bodhi Hospital outside Bangkok. Some steps of the conventional IVF procedures have been modified due to their limited resources. Simplification of procedures enable the IVF service to be available in a center without compromising the results. Other advantages as outlined by the authors are improvement of the patient's convenience, cost savings, less time consumed, as well as being less stressful. Essentially, what they did was they eliminated the blood workup they monitored the cycles only with ultrasound, and they use low doses of HMG, cheap gonadotropins, generic forms of which were available in Thailand. So actually, just by doing these simple things, by reducing the total dose of gonadotropins, by avoiding excess embryos, so avoiding cryopreservation, using ultrasound for monitoring, they could bring down the cost of conventional IVF by nearly 50%. In India, we have been trying to make IVF more affordable to ensure a wider reach across the socioeconomic strata with the introduction of what we have been talking for the last two days, namely the IVF light. This was a recent editorial I wrote for the Indian Journal of OBGYN, whereas we debated whether IVF light is the future of assisted reproduction especially in low-resource economies where money really matters when you talk about IVF. So routine IVF today is being challenged by this list of cost-effective methodologies, natural cycle IVF, mini IVF or minimal stimulation IVF, and what we feel is going to be the mainstream today is IVF light which includes minimal stimulation IVF, vitrification of all the embryos generated, accumulation of embryos over a few months, and remote embryo transfer in prepared cycles, either in natural cycles or hormonally manipulated cycles. Some of these slides are an overlap from yesterday, but for people who have come in today, a minimal stimulation IVF cycle is defined either as a stimulation regimen in which gonadotropins are administered at a lower than usual dose or and for a shorter duration throughout a cycle in which GnRH antagonist is a pillar stone, is a cornerstone for all these minimal stim cycles or is a stimulation in which oral compounds like clomiphene citrate are used either alone or in combination with gonadotropins and GnRH antagonists. These are some data from June 2010 to November 2012 from our center that our group presented at the recent ESHRE. We had a couple of posters, and this is data from there. So if you look at the IVF light in blue with 97 and conventional IVF 125, we have 
excellent pregnancy rates, clinical pregnancy rate per ET, pregnancy rate per patient, and percentage of cycles with cancelled embryo transfers. Because we are doing freezing of all the embryos generated, we don't have any cancelled embryo transfers. And this is really cost effective and is really helpful to patients who in countries like India, they sell off their jewelry and their lands and keep things on mortgage and come and do IVF cycles. And when you talk about comparison of dosage of gonadotropins between IVF light and conventional IVF protocols, again, there is a huge difference. So a huge difference in savings of cost. And in low resource economies in developing countries, this is really important if we can change the mindset of practitioners from conventional IVF to IVF light. You look at the success rates between IVF light and conventional IVF groups when you talk of all indications. Here we are talking of initially we started with poor responders, then we included patients with previous IVF failures. Older age groups was the third group, and the fourth group that we added to IVF light was the hyper responders. When we compare all groups together, even then when you look at the clinical pregnancy rate per patient, we can stretch it up to 58%. This is from June 2010 to 2012. So mild stimulation protocols reduce the mean number of days of stimulation, the total amount of gonadotropins used, the mean number of oocytes retrieved. The proportion of high quality embryo seems to be higher compared with conventional IVF protocols and the pregnancy rate per embryo transfer is comparable. With the reduced cost, the better tolerability for patients and the less time needed to complete an IVF cycle, these mild approaches are gaining a permanent foothold in cost sensitive economies. What are other groups thinking? How can they make IVF more affordable? Again, there has been a resurgence of something called INVO. It came about seven to 10 years ago, and now they have reintroduced this thing. And in Pakistan, they have reported in some early pregnancies using this technique. So intravaginal culture, also called INVO, in intravaginal culture of oocytes is an ART procedure where oocyte fertilization and early embryo development are carried out within a gas-permeable, air-free plastic device placed into the maternal vaginal cavity for incubation. INVO can be performed in a physician's office or in a satellite facility of an IVF center. Of late, in the last two years, there has been a resurgence of reports, mainly from the collaborating groups in Switzerland and France. And what I have heard from friends who have practiced this technique is that this company offers a dual pricing policy. So if it is a developing country like Africa or Pakistan or India, they would give this device at a much cheaper rate than what they would sell in the developed world. The INVO procedure consists of fertilization of oocytes and early embryo development in the INVO cell placed into the maternal vaginal cavity for incubation. The vaginal cavity therefore replaces the complex IVF laboratory. They have replaced the incubators with the vaginal cavity. Over 800 cycles have been published worldwide. They have reported the results and showed a clinical pregnancy rate of 19.6%. And they're trying to fine tune this so that the rates increase. This is from Fertility Sterility 2010. So this is how the device looks like. The guy holding the device is the inventor of this device. And it goes into a diaphragm and goes into the vagina. It's a small device. And I believe at the ASRM now next week, they are going to introduce the latest version of this Invo BioCell, which will have some more advantages of gas permeability. This is from 2012, the report, the report from the researchers. In a recent study, the authors assessed the outcome using the recently upgraded InvoCell device, which will be launched next week at the ASRM, in combination with a mild ovarian stimulation protocol. A total of 125 cycles were performed. 
An average 6.5 oocytes per cycle were retrieved and a mean of 4.2 were placed per invo cell device. The cleavage rate obtained was 63% with vaginal culture. The procedure yielded 40% clinical pregnancy, 31% live birth and 24% single live birth rates per cycle. These published results hold promise that the invo procedure is an effective alternative treatment option in ART and shows comparable results to conventional IVF techniques. This is what I was talking about. In 2013 May, from Karachi, Pakistan, a group has reported a case treated with intravaginal culture which resulted in successful fertilization of eggs and embryo development with Pakistan's first intravaginal culture intrauterine pregnancy since this is the first successful case but this has caught on because this device was offered i think at one fifth the cost it costs about just seven or eight pounds to developing countries and certain countries have taken this up in a big way from the beginning of this year we will actually know in the next ashray what are the real results from use of this device this was also a breaking news in the June Eshray at London, a study performed last year in Belgium with another in vitro cheap culture device has shown that low cost IVF for developing and poor resource countries is feasible and effective with delivery rates not much different from those achieved in IVF programs. This is a completely different approach. So you can actually make out that how groups are trying to make IVF more cost effective without decreasing pregnancy rates. So how did this group from Belgium offer low cost IVF? So Clark Sito led 11 month prospective study at Genk in which oocytes were cultured according to two groups. One had a regular IVF culturing and the second had this TWE lab IVF culture system. What is this system? In this system, an optimal culture environment was obtained without the need of medical gases, without the need of conventional incubators that we use for IVF, and without the need for expensive infrastructure like modular labs and HVAC units. Similar rates of fertilization and cleavage were obtained in both the groups. In 23 out of 35 cycles, almost 66% 6 of patients, the top quality embryo selected by an independent embryologist originated not from the conventional culture system, but from the TWE lab system. This low cost culture system is based on an incubator system. It's a very simple concept, consisting of two sealed glass tubes, a chemical reaction initiated by combining simple baking soda and citric acid in the first sealed tube generates an atmosphere that includes a specific percentage of carbon dioxide. This atmosphere is then transferred into the second glass tube holding the culture medium. The connection between the two glass tubes are just needles and plus rubber tubing can easily be removed once the equilibrium between the two glass tubes is achieved. Oocytes and sperm are then injected by syringe into the tube containing the culture medium without disturbing the air environment within the tube. The researchers call this proof of principle study suggested that infertility care may now be universally accessible. The authors showed that IVF methodology can be significantly simplified and result in successful outcomes at levels that compare favorably to those obtained in high resource programs. They concluded that the cost of their simplified culture system is just 10% of current costs in Western style IVF programs and computed that a cycle of IVF with this simplified procedure can be performed for under 200 euros. This was really a path breaking news at the last ashray. The pillars in the successful implementation of IVF in low resource areas include simplification of ART procedures like adopting IVF light, minimizing the complication rates of procedures with the elimination of OHSs, adopting one of these new culture methods providing training courses for health workers and incorporating infertility treatment into sexual and reproductive health care programs. Thank you for a very patient hearing.